On the surface, all can look calm, denying the turbulent truth that lurks beneath. Things seem so good. Every ripple causes pain, division, and distraction, echoing out and churning up the waters of our faith. You'd think we would have figured it out by now. If only I'd spoken louder or taught clear his truth. Would these waves of confusion and doubt have stilled by now? It's all a haze, murky waters, and dimming light. Our divine purpose and mission seem so distant, almost out of reach. Where do we go from here? Yet in spite of the chaos, there's a stillness, a clarity, a beckoning to remember the timeless wisdom and teaching that echoes back to his loving light. Dear Church, Dear Church, it is good to have you here in the room. Those of you joining us online, our Skagit campus, uh, so good. I tell you what, never, ever get tired of baptisms. Just love celebrating that. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, we will continue on uh, today in this series, Dear Church, where a pastor, Pastor Paul, the Apostle Paul, had planted this church in Corinth, and now he writes them a letter. And we've been looking at different issues, lessons, out of uh, truths out of that letter uh, for us as well. And we'll see that again today. I um, had, a, had a recommendation of a friend to listen to a, lo a long form podcast, and this one was like over three hours long. Fortunately, last weekend I had some traveling and a lot of driving to do, so I had plenty of time. But it was a, a podcast from the Huberman Lab. It was an interview or a conversation with a man named Dr. Noam Sobel, and his whole area of expertise is with um, olfaction the biological mechanisms of our sense of smell. And he just, I mean, this is his area of expertise, so he nerded out on it for three hours. And not that I've been terribly interested, I mean, I love to smell good things, but it was fascinating. I, I, know, I may, probably won't ever do any more research on this, but it was fascinating. In the midst of all this, you could tell this was an area of passion for him. And he kind of said, and he didn't use these words, but he kind of alluded to the fact that olfactory, olfaction, is kind of the Cinderella sense. I mean, there's vision, of course. We all want that. And if we don't have that, we have glasses or seeing eye dogs or all kinds. Of, and there's hearing, and we have hearing aids and all this stuff. He said, you know, the sense of smell kind of gets, you know, yeah, okay, that's fine. We're grateful for that. But he made a point that there are times, while we may not acknowledge it, that our sense of smell is actually more important than our sense of sight, which is a pretty bold statement. And he said, for instance, if you had an absolutely beautiful layered cake, fantastic looking cake, baked to perfection, stacked and layered there with strawberries and blueberries and icing and whipped creams. Absolutely beautiful. You, you look at this masterpiece and it just makes your mouth water. And then as you approach it, you saw this beautiful cake, but it smelled of raw sewage. At that point, it doesn't matter how beautiful the cake looks because you are overpowered by the smell. Interesting point. When he said that, I won't get into where he was going with that, but when he said that, my mind went to this church in Corinth. Because on the one hand, it's this beautifully crafted layered cake that is so beautiful. It seems from the outward appearance so perfect. I mean, they're in an ideal location. Corinth was this metropolitan city where they had great opportunity to impact the community. Not only that, but it was a port city, so people were coming and going. They can impact the entire region. And they were a wealthy church. They weren't a poor church. It was a, a booming economy. They had a lot of resources financially. And even more important than the financial resources, they had more spiritual gifts. They had all the spiritual gifts. Paul alludes to this in chapter one in the early verse. Says, you have all the spiritual gifts you've needed. God has given you these gifts. And they've had incredible pastors. They've had celebrity pastors. When the apostle Paul is your founding pastor, you're set up for good things. And they also had Apollos, and, and they had Priscilla and Aquila, and Timothy and Titus, all these people that had been of their pastors. And what God had done in their midst to see people who were so far from God 
in a culture that is so anti-anything of the Bible and to see what God birthed there, this church that's alive and thriving and growing from all outward appearance. This looks like a beautiful layered cake and yet there's this stench that is coming from the church. In fact, the whole reason Paul writes this letter is because that aroma has drifted to him while he is hundreds of miles away and he's picked up on the fact that there is something that is putrid, something that is rancid, something that is repulsive in this church. And so in the letter, he addresses some of the sources of this stench that's coming out of this church. And in the passage we're gonna look at today, he comes to what I would believe he would say would be really the remedy for all the stench in the church. If they could get this one piece right, it would take care of most of the other issues. That this issue that he talks about today, while it falls late in the letter, is truly the thematic epicenter of the entire letter and the whole purpose of the letter. This is the crux of the matter. Now, as we look at this today, um, for many of you, uh, and arguably for most of us, the passage we're going to look at is the most familiar passage out of the entire book of 1 Corinthians, maybe out of the entire first and second books of Corinthians. It is the best known, probably the most loved passage and very, very familiar. The passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and if you have a tablet or a Bible or device, you can go there if you want. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, some of you are very familiar with this. You know where we're going with this somewhat. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know this passage. But he says, this is the remedy for pretty much all the problems we face in this church in Corinth. Now, he sets it up. Last week, Cynthia shared out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the body of Christ, the gifts were all a part of this. And the reason that, that Paul even wrote that was because there was division amongst them. There was some superiority and rankings of people and some feeling like they're more important than others and put downs and judgment and envying of gifts and all this. He says, no, 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 there's, no one's more important than the other. We're all equally important. We all have been given gifts. And in the process of all this, while he's trying to deal with all this division and this envy and all this tension in the church, he ends chapter 12 and sets up chapter 13 with this incredible verse. He's done all this. He's confronting all these issues. And he says, chapter 12, verse 31, and now, now, I will show you the most excellent way. I love that phrase. Because he's been talking about all this stuff, all this stuff, confronting all these things, all the issues they've got, the lawsuits and the backbiting and the fighting. Now, he says, now, now let me show you the most excellent way. He doesn't say, let me show you another way. He doesn't even say, let me show you an excellent way or a most excellent way. He says, let me show you the most excellent way. I mean, there's this invitation, there's this anticipation. What is this? He's good. I'm going to reveal to you how it's really ordained to be, how we are supposed to, this is the crux of, this is the highest thing. That verse for me, I, I mean, I've read that verse throughout my life. That verse for me changed in 1989. Because in 1989, there was this cinematographical masterpiece called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And part of it was that Bill and Ted, they would always use the word most, like most unprecedented or most egregious. And then they would always say excellent. Well, Paul comes along and he combines them. He says, I want to show you the most excellent way. Now, I want to just for a moment talk about Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. A little bit of a spoiler alert. Of course, you've had 34 years to watch it. So that's on you if you haven't seen this. Bill and Ted are seniors in high school. They're, they're almost ready to graduate, but they may not make it unless their senior project is phenomenal. So there's a guy named Rufus. He helps them do time travel, not in a DeLorean, but in a phone booth. And they go back throughout history and they find personages of historical significance. And so they bring back all these people and it's just a lot of fun. So at their last senior project, they got the whole school in the auditorium. They bring all these different ones out, Joan of Arc and Genghis Khan and everybody, you know, Napoleon. And their last guest is Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln walks out onto the stage and he starts his address. Four score and 20 minutes ago. And he talks about Bill and Ted and all this. And he said, talks about these two guys 
who were dedicated, here's his words, dedicated to a proposition that was true in my time and is true today. And then he makes a statement. Here's the proposition. Be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes. That part doesn't fit with the scripture. But here's the proposition. Here's the proposition that was true in Paul's day, and it's true in our day. Be excellent to each other, and he's going to show what does this look like. He's going to take them down this path of excellence because he wants them to be choosing the greatest option in living. They've seen other options. They've participated in other options. The Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to the man, but in the end it leads to destruction. They've lived that way. They've lived the way the rest of the culture has lived. They've lived that way even within the church, and it has caused division and destruction and all kinds of heartache and broken relationships. And he says, now I want to show you the most excellent way. And then he's going to go ahead and explain all this excellent way. Interesting thing is that in 1 Corinthians 13, there's like these bookends in chapter 12 and chapter 14. Now, whoever broke up the, the, the book, I, I don't know, but it seems like they, they missed it just by a few minutes. So at the end of, of 12, we just said, when he says, I will show you now the most excellent way, then he does what we're going to look at. And then he starts chapter 14 with these words. He says, follow the way of love. Opens up. I'm going to show you the most excellent way. He tells them, now follow the way of love. Be excellent to each other. Honestly, I debated even up until a couple of weeks ago whether or not to use one of our weekends in this series for this chapter, primarily because it is so familiar, and for some it seems so sentimental. I mean, even yesterday when I was doing some memorization, my wife walked in and said, how are you feeling about your sermon? I said, eh. She goes, well, what's the hesitation? I said, it's just so familiar. She said, well, what are you preaching? I said, in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, love is patient, love is kind. She said, oh, the wedding passage. <laughs> My point exactly. <laughs> that some of us, many of us, have heard this, and it's always in this nice, sentimental, romantic, gushy setting of a wedding. And no, listen, if I use this scripture at your wedding, you're still married, that's good. Okay, I'm, I'm not putting that down at all. But we're, many of us, are, we've memorized this. We've, we've got cross-stitched, you know, love is patient, love is kind on our, you know, on our shelves. Or what. I mean, it, it's just, it's so nice. It's so, oh, it's so sentimental. It's so inspiring. It, it's, it's, it's like the precious moments of 1 Corinthians. Just give us all big droopy eyes. We'll all be happy here. And I debated not even using one of these weekends for this passage. But the reason I landed on this is because I want us to relook at 1 Corinthians 13 today not as information or even inspiration, but for life transformation. I want this to change our lives. And so I'm hoping and I'm praying that for some of you who have this memorized, some of you who had this at your wedding, some of you who know this inside and out, some of you who have taught on this, that we can just maybe put all that beside instead of saying, yeah, I've got this down, to say, God, what would you have for me today? See, the context that we normally hear, 1 Corinthians 13, and again, I'm not slamming this, is in weddings. That's where we most often hear this passage. And in a wedding, I mean, you know, the setting is amazing. Here's this man, here's this woman. They're beautiful. They've lost weight. They've gotten fake tans. They, they're in tuxedos and gowns and hair's done and makeup and all this. And their family and their friends are surrounding them. And there's going to be food and dancing. It's a joyful deal. They're going to make promises. And they all smell good. What's not to love about that setting? But when Paul writes these words, it's not at a wedding. They're not all sitting around with whitened teeth and sprayed on tans and smelling good. He's writing to a church that is filled with stench. That's the purpose for this, this passage. A church that has pride. A church that has been abusing some of the spiritual gifts. A church, a church where there's this division and there's this envying going on and self-centeredness and greed. There's lawsuits amongst them. They're putting each other down. They're, they're, they're performing even their church services and their communions and these things in a way that is dishonoring to the Lord. It, it's, it's, a, it's a stench that he's addressing. It's not a sentimental, romantic moment. 
Now, as we get into this, there's two things I want to acknowledge. First is, just like in the whole series with this book, there is so much in 1 Corinthians, I honestly believe I could do a 10, 12 part series just on this chapter, and I've only got 30 minutes-ish or so, 40, so, to do this. So we're not going to even hit all of it. The second thing is this. It is possible to start dissecting things and, and kind of micro-analyzing things that you miss the whole, the beauty of it. Someone once said, you can, you can dissect humor like a frog, but it will die in the process. And it's the same with a scripture. You can get down into the, the Greek of this word and this syntax and all this stuff and miss the whole point. Like taking a flower, a beautiful rose, and analyzing it petal by petal, and at the end, you, you've looked at all the petals, but you no longer have a rose. I understand, and I don't want to do that to this passage. So what I want to start with is I want to read it in its entirety, just so we can hear it again in context before we start taking some petals off. I want to read it out of the New Living Translation, just maybe for some of you that will change it up in the way that you've heard it or memorized it in the past. But let me just read this chapter. Paul writes, remember, this is not at a wedding. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I had the gift of prophecy, and I could understand all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such a faith that, that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I, I'd be nothing. I mean, if I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice, sacrificed my body, I mean, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I, I would have gained nothing. You see, love, love is patient. And love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It, it does not demand its own way. It, it's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It, it's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Because see, like prophecies and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, that will become useless. But love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only, only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child... Okay, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That is not just a romantic, sentimental passage. That is one of the most profound, difficult passages you will ever try to live out. And when Paul writes it, he's not trying to have them say, oh, he is giving them a very, strong rebuke and showing them the most excellent way. Now, the passage itself, the chapter itself, is really kind of has three parts. We won't even get to all three of them. The first one talks about, you know, kind of this, this whole supremacy and the necessity of love. The second one is kind of a definition, the character of love. And the final one is like the enduring, lasting nature of love. So if you want it alliterated like a good pastor would do, it's the preeminence of love, the practice of love, and the permanence of love. We're going to look a little bit at the, the priority, the preeminence, and the practice. We probably won't get to that last one. But Paul starts it off. Let's get into this. Paul starts it off, and he does this in a brilliant way. Instead of saying, you guys really need to get... He, instead, 
He puts a hypothetical situation out there for them to consider. In fact, it's not a hypothetical situation about a make-believe church. It's a hypothetical situation about himself. So he says, let's take a look at me and let's pretend. So this is what he says, chapter 13, verse 1. He says, okay, let's say, if I were to speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Maybe that's not so hypothetical after all, because Paul did speak. He was an incredible orator. He spoke in the tongues of men. He communicated to to kings and to rulers, to magistrates, to common people, to foreigners, to Jewish people, to Gentiles. He spoke and people gave their hearts. He did speak that way. He was a very, very talented orator. And in addition to that, He spoke in the tongues of angels. He he talks about this in chapter 14, how he does have the gift of tongues, this, this angelic language, and which, by the way, the gift of tongues had become so front and center for this church, it had become such a priority that there was some so much misuse of it that the entirety of chapter 14 is trying to get them straightened out on this gift. But he says, I I can speak. I do have this gift. I have these talents. They had experienced this. He had preached to them. Their lives had been changed by that. So it's not so hypothetical. He says, if I have all that, but I don't have love, everything that comes out of my mouth, all of my lips moving, it's like a resounding gong. I think the ESV says a noisy gong. We don't use that word resounding so much. It's it's like a gong. I was thinking about that this week. I'm thinking, there's really four times in my life that I remember anything that had, four things in my life that had anything to do with a gong. The first one was the original Adams family, the black and white, when Gomez would pull that big rope and the big gong would shake the whole house. And then Lurch would say, you ring. You remember that? Okay. That was a gong. The other one, and you have to be really old to understand this one, was the gong show. And Chuck Barris would come out and have this talent. It's kind of like America's Got Talent, but they really didn't, and he would gong them. That was, you know, get them off the stage. The third one was Bohemian Rhapsody. The closing line, you know, any way the wind blows. And the fourth one is a Mongolian restaurant that I used to go to in Vancouver that at the entrance had this big gong with a mallet. It was there for ambiance and look, but I couldn't pass it without banging on this gong. And then I thought about it, you know, all four gongs in my life have actually been a good thing. I, I, I haven't really been bothered by those. They've been, they've been wonderful. I mean, I've bothered people in that Mongolian restaurant. It's, it's now no longer open, probably because of me. They could have just taken the gong away and not saved the restaurant. But, but regardless, the gong thing just doesn't really resonate. Think of what is most annoying musically. I mean, and I'm going to offend some of you. For some of you, he, he'd be like saying, I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if I have not love, it's like bagpipes. I'm sorry, I heard a little, ooh, okay, sorry for all the pipers. Uh, I, no, no. It's like an accordion. It's like a banjo. It's like a third grader with a recorder that his teacher sent home from school. Now we're talking. It's like feedback. It's something that's so annoying, the most, uh, the most annoying noise you could ever imagine, where you just cover your ears and say, make it stop. It says, don't you understand that, that I could preach like the greatest preacher in the world. I could have some spiritual gift. You're going, wow. But if I don't have love, it's so annoying. It's like, make it stop. I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, what you do speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. And I wonder how many times in the church what we do speaks so loudly that our world can't hear what we say. All right, if we don't keep going, we'll never get through this. Verse two, he gives another hypothetical situation, putting himself at the center of the ring again. Verse two, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Again, maybe this isn't a hypothetical situation because he has the gift of prophecy. He can foretell the truth of God's word. 
And while he may not have all mysteries, Paul's got some pretty good theology. And when you write a book like Romans or Ephesians or Colossians, the guy understands the, the hidden things of God. And he might not know everything, but he has quite a bit of knowledge. I mean, he was schooled as a Pharisee at the top of his class. He, he did spend time with Jesus, and he spent time with the disciples. He had a lot of knowledge. And you want to talk about faith. Here's a guy that walks into a town like Corinth as most, the most ungodly, far from God town you could ever imagine. So secular, so worldly, so cosmopolitan. He walks in and says, this looks like a good place to plant a church. And he goes in and just begins proclaiming the gospel and people come to know it takes a lot of faith to do that. So he's setting himself up again and says, listen, I've done all these things. And if I start thinking like I ought to be something here, if I don't have love, it doesn't matter what I've done, I am nothing. In fact, earlier, I think it's in chapter eight, he had said, listen, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And then he does another one in chapter, in verse three, where he talks about, you know, the generosity. And maybe he's talking about them because they were a very wealthy church. If I give all I possess to the poor, or there's a sacrifice, if I surrender my body to the flames, but I don't have love, I I gain nothing. And while he's pointing to himself, it's a reflection of their church that they have all of this religious stuff going on, but they've missed the most essential element. Jonathan Swift, um, no relation to Taylor, by the way, uh, he wrote um, Gulliver's Travel and a Modest Proposal. He wrote these words, we have just enough religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. And this was the case with this church. They had all this religious stuff, but it brought about pride and it brought about division and even hatred and envy and all of these things. And what he's trying to help them understand is not, oh, we're gathered for this wonderful wedding. He says, no, we've got to get some things right here. There's a stench that's coming out of this church. And it's not just about what you do, more than the actions beyond the activity. It's the person. It's the heart. It's the motive. What's what's underneath that with this person? And isn't that what Jesus was referring to when he gives them the seven woes? Woe to you, you teachers of the law, you Pharisees. You are like whitewashed tombs. You are like a beautiful layered cake. But inside you are filled of dead man's bones and everything unclean. You look good on the outside. You've got all the activities going on. But there's an emptiness. There's something missing. You see, this church in Corinth had everything they could ever want. They had the gifts, they had the wealth, they had the opportunity, they had the great leaders, they had the pastor, they had God working, they had all these things. And he gives them kind of an equation. You have everything, but everything minus love equals nothing. This is the priority for you. Be excellent to each other. So then he says, just to make sure that we're clear, I want to talk to you about what does it mean to love? I want to know what love is, they say. What is this love? Because it's not just some philosophical thing. It's not just some flowery, lofty deal out there. It's not, not just some ethereal concept. And it's not even a feeling. He says, I want you to be really clear about what we're talking about here. And so in the next four verses, verse four, five, six, and seven, he gives these, this kind of a, a picture, a, a definition of what love is. And in these, in these four verses, he gives 15 descriptors of what love is. Um, in fact, there are 15 verbs. Uh, I'll take some of you back to the early DC talk days. I don't care what they say. I don't care what you heard. The word love, yo, love is a verb. So he says, I'm going to give you the 15 verbs. And we'll look at where these came, up, came from, but let's start with just the first two out of verse four, when he says, here's what love is. Love is patient, and love is kind. Again, we say, oh, yeah, that's nice. Now, wait a second. 
What's the opposite of patient and kind? Well, impatient, obviously. Mean, cruel, harsh. You say, well, that's not me. Okay, two words for you. The first word, traffic. <laughs> traffic. For me specifically, roundabouts. <laughs> Some of you have heard me preach about this. There's one time when you would not be proud to call me your pastor. It's at a roundabout. I've decided if ever I'm in charge of purifying the gene pool, I will stand at a roundabout, and anytime one of the imbeciles come into it, zip. I need to have on my GPS a little voice that says, there's a roundabout coming up. Remember, love is patient, love is kind. Because I get in a roundabout, and the absolutely foolish, brainless people are like, how are you even driving? Regardless. Traffic. Last night after service, a lady came to me and she said, Bob, I've always thought of myself as, as really loving. I thought this is not a problem for me. And then when you said traffic, I hate tailgaters. And she got real livid. She says, when people are on my tail, I fantasize of all the things I would like to have happen to that car. I'm like, oh, wow. Here she goes. Hit the oil slick. Send out the tax. You know, <laughs> the, the bright lights. Blow them off. Traffic. Love is patient. Love is kind. You say, oh, yeah, yeah. But no, 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 no. Second word, Thanksgiving. Because in just over a week and a half, you'll be together with people that you prefer to not be together with. You endure it once or twice a year because, well, they married in, or somehow you unfortunately got born into this family, or they're coming, and that uncle, and that boyfriend, or that in-law, and, uh, and here we go together. And it's, Thanksgiving is, is anything but a day of thanks for you. Love is patient. Love is kind. Doesn't mean you have to enjoy them. <laughs> but are you patient? Are you kind? And you wonder, did, did Paul just randomly come up with these words? I don't think so. I think they're very specific by design. Later, he would write a, a letter to the church in Rome. And look how he uses the same words. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. He writes, or do you show contempt for the riches of his, talking about God, the riches of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? That God has been so patient and continues, if you're anything like me, continues to be patient. He's been so kind and he continues to be so kind to walk with me in my journey, to bring me along. And he says, if you've experienced that kind of patience and kindness from our Heavenly Father and continue to experience it maybe on a daily basis, how could you do anything less than have this patience and kindness for others? Now, we're not going to go through all 15 but you wonder, where did he come up with this list? You know, did, did the church in Corinth say, hey, Paul, give us, a, give us a working definition of love. And he's like, well, let me give that some thought. I can see if I can come up with some bullet points. Now, actually, if you look at this definition out of these first four, out of these four verses, it really is kind of the, all he had to do was look at the Corinthian church and give the antithesis of what they're already doing. In fact, earlier in the letter, he already has addressed some of these issues. So let me just read through it again. Love is patient. It's love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I think what he's saying to them is, listen, when you're interacting with people, the way that you would normally respond, the, normally, the way you would normally react, the, normally, the way that you would normally relate to them, just stop and say, is this what I should do? Because you probably need to do just the opposite. And he paints a picture. If they would be loving like godly loving to one another, all of these other issues that they've had, the pride, the division, the envy, the, the lawsuits, the greed, the putting one another down, the ranking, the putting the, all of that would actually be taken care of. 
Not only does he give them an ideal, a picture to go for, he gives them a picture of a person. Because when you look at that list, that looks a lot like Jesus. So you could substitute Jesus for love. Like Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. He's not rude. He's not self-seeking and on through. Do you say, what a beautiful, beautiful picture. What a beautiful life Jesus lived. And while he sets this bar and paints this picture, he could also substitute not just Jesus, but your name, because this is the goal. And now when I read it this way, Bob is patient. Bob is kind. Bob does not envy. Bob does not boast. He's not proud. He's, he's not rude. See, when I read it with my name in there, there's a whole lot more question marks than exclamation points. <laughs> and if you ask my wife, there wouldn't even be a question mark. <laughs> this is what we're called to do. Do you understand how this is not just a sentimental passage? This is one of the most practical, gritty passages that are so difficult to live. You know, in the mid-90s, um, I had the privilege, throughout the 90s, I had the privilege of two or three times traveling to India, uh, to Calcutta specifically, to work with Mother Teresa's homes. And um, took a couple groups from here, went on with another group as well. And uh, actually, uh, on uh, a couple of the trips, actually got to meet Mother Teresa. On one of the trips, uh, in fact, we had a picture. Remember, this is a, a few years ago. But got to sit down with Mother Teresa. Just five or six of us in a room there with Mother Teresa. By the way, if we're ever in a group together and you do a crowd breaker of who's the most famous person you ever met, I win those ones, okay? So just, unless you pull Jesus. All right, good enough. So I'm with Mother Teresa there. And we sat in there. There's like five or six of us in this room. We're talking. And she's asking where we've been serving. We have raised money, saved money, sacrificed, given money. We've flown halfway across the world. We're in India. We're in Calcutta. We're working in Mother Teresa's homes for the homes for the dying, for the orphanage, for the lepers, doing some of the most uh, dirty jobs I've ever done and all that. And she's asking us, where have you been serving? What's going on? And we were telling her, telling her where we came from, telling her all this stuff. And you know what? She wasn't impressed at all that we had spent all this money and taken vacation time and traveled halfway across the world to go and serve in her home. She wasn't really impressed with that. In fact, what she was most interested in was not so much of when are you coming back or how long can you stay, but how are you living this way at home? She's very familiar uh, or very well known for this statement when she says, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. She didn't need me to fly halfway across the world to serve in her orphanage. What she realized is this world needed me to be willing to go next door, to be willing to drive, to be willing to interact, to be willing to love. Because it's glorious, glamorous, noble to go across the world and work in Mother Teresa's home for the dying. Oh, that's great. But what about when it's with that annoying person that you work with? What if when it's with that family member? Because sometimes the ones that we love the most are the ones that we're the most harsh to. That parent, that child, that sibling, the coworker, that boss, that neighbor. That in-law is to love like that. All right, I, I'm, I'm way out of time. Let, let's, let's move on. Let's, let's jump, jump to verse 13. This is in that third passage, but I just want to point this one out. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now, now you know this. There's a world of difference between being childlike and childish. Jesus called us to be like a child. Paul himself will talk about this in the next chapter, I think, chapter 14, verse 20. It says, as far as evil goes, be like a child. Be innocent, be naive. Don't even know about that. 
But being childish, you, you think about a child. Child's really all about themselves. Child's impatient. I want it now. Child will pout, throw a temper tantrum, not share the toys. It's all about my little world. He says, when I was a child, that's how I operated. But when I grew up, I realized you, you don't think that way anymore. And what he's telling them is, is not just in a chronological way or even in just relational way, but when it comes to love, they've been operating like children. The backbiting, the factions, the division, the, all this stuff that's going on. He says, you were children, don't do that anymore. Grow up, he would say. Grow up, start spiritually, lovingly adulting. Start loving like an adult, where you're not the center of things, where you're thinking of others, where you don't hold on to grudges and you pout about it, where you forgive, where, where you continue to have this love. At the end of the whole thing, end of chapter 13, he says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And he concludes the chapter and opens the 14th with these words. The greatest of these is love. Follow the way of love, the most excellent way. Dear church, he says. So let me wrap it up this way. Dear Cornwall, how are we doing on this? What are we known for? See, there's a lot of things as a church that we could be known for. We could be known for our worship, Great worship where there's engagement and people are pouring their hearts out to God and great vocalists and musicians. It's wonderful. I want to be known for a great worship. We could be known for preaching. Maybe not. We could be known for theology or that, that in the midst of our world that we hold to an uncompromising biblical theology and we will not, so we, can be known, we can be known for our children's ministry where children have a spiritual foundation laid for them where there's a ministry that comes alongside of what the parents are doing at the home so that kids know that they can be with Jesus forever and he can be their best friend. Our middle school ministry where kids can be in this crazy season of life but know that there's a Jesus who loves them and friends and adults that will actually listen to them and walk with them and high school students that are wrestling with all kinds of thoughts and pressures and stuff and to know that Jesus is still true and our young adults, we can have all that. We can be known for all of that. We can be known for our, our community groups and discipleship that's going on. We can be known for our community outreach and the go and be and what we make a difference. In it. We can be known for all of that. But if it's not infused, built on, and completely surrounded by a motive, a heart of love, it means nothing. What if Cornwall Church was known for radical love? Like 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Not sentimental. Radical love. And we will only be known for radical love when we as individuals in the power of the Holy Spirit begin to live a life of radical love. 1 Corinthians 13, I will continue to use it in weddings. But what if we use 1 Corinthians 13 for people that annoy us? People from a different political persuasion than us. People who don't believe like us or don't believe at all people who don't hold our morality, people who have a different lifestyle, a different preference, a different orientation, a different gender choice. What if we loved this way for people who preach tolerance but are intolerant towards Christians? To love. What if we love people who slander and put down and malign and abuse the church? To love with a radical love. To love those we disagree with. To love those that, we, that annoy us. To love those that in some ways maybe even repulse some of our innermost core convictions and doctrines. It doesn't mean you have to agree. It doesn't mean you have to compromise. And it doesn't mean you don't have to have boundaries. But we are called to love 
radically. Jesus said this in John 13. By this all men will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. The most excellent way. The way of love. Here's what I challenge you with this week. This week, take those four verses, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. There's 15 verbs in there. And maybe take them from a different translation. Uh, I like the, the NLT, actually, because there's some stuff later that I like how it's phrased better. But take these 15, and with honesty and a surrender and an invitation to the Holy Spirit to walk through and say, where is one that I need God to continue to shape me in? And it may not take long. <laughs> you may get to the first one and say, I'm there. And to just say, okay, God, I want to have a life that looks a lot more like Jesus. I want to live a life that is radically loving, even those that are so difficult, only by the power of your spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love. And by your power, I want to live that kind of life. Be excellent to each other.